twisted minds of the wicked, unveiling three chilling tales of horror. Let the horror commence. This happened to my mother and me a few months ago in October. It happened in a very rural area of New Hampshire, like a neighborhood with a side road on a side road. It was pouring outside as it had been for most of the day. My mom had just returned from down the street in my sister's car and I was sitting on the couch in the living room when the doorbell rang. Our front door has a large glass pane in the front allowing us to see out from the inside and others to see in from the outside. I saw a man through this window pane. I couldn't get a good look at him because I didn't have my long distance glasses on but the man noticed me and waved as if trying to be friendly. Poncho Man will be his name for the rest of this. I stood up and considered opening the door for Poncho Man, but I decided against it because I couldn't see who it was. I didn't want to invite a stranger into my home, so I went down the hall to my parents' bedroom where my mother was getting ready for work. She inquired as to what was going on, and I informed her that a man in a poncho was standing outside our door and wanted to speak with us. She became as white as a ghost and immediately stopped getting ready, closed and locked the bedroom door, and began checking the windows to ensure they were all locked. I inquired about what was going on. My mother explained that she had seen the poncho man while driving home. He had been standing motionless on the main street, and as soon as my mother turned down our road, he began to walk, presumably to follow her. She described the encounter as strange but said nothing more about it. Why would someone be out in the rain on a back road in the middle of the afternoon? He appeared to be waiting for something. I began to panic as well. My mother called my aunt, who is like a best friend to me, and asked her what we should do. My aunt told her to call the cops right away, so we did. We paced around the bedroom frantically looking out the windows to see if we could see Poncho Man from the angle at which the bedroom was set. It was impossible to see if he was still on the front porch, but we were desperate for anything. We finally saw a police car pull up after what seemed like hours. We carefully unlocked the door, went inside to let the officer in, and told him what we had seen. Then he agreed to conduct a neighborhood scan. As he walked away, I noticed something on the doorknob. I removed it, and it was a political advertisement for a candidate running for office. Poncho Man could have been campaigning for the candidate. But there are numerous flaws in that story. It was tripping. So why would you go door to door? Why would you go that route in such a desolate area? The houses are so far apart that walking between them would barely make a dent. The time is also incongruous. Yes, my mother and I were home, but it was around four o'clock in the afternoon. Most people would still be at work, so knocking would likely elicit no response. The officer eventually returned. He had tracked down the man and questioned him. Poncho Man was able to identify himself and he claimed to be a political campaigner who was simply knocking on doors for that purpose. When pressed further, the Poncho Man couldn't provide any other door signs besides the one he had left on. Ours was the final one. That only adds to the absurdity of his campaign story. Our home is located in the middle of the street. We weren't the last ones by any means. So why wouldn't you bring enough for the entire block? Even the officer noticed this and commented that it was unusual behavior. Although the officer was suspicious of him, he couldn't do anything because there was no way to prove intent. He wanted us to stay alert and not be afraid to call when the poncho man returned. After a few weeks, I began to notice that a police car was always stationed down the road from us, about a three minute drive away. I became curious and asked my mother about it 
and she told me that there had been multiple break-ins to the houses down the road and that the police were conducting a sting operation. The Poncho Man encounter and the break-ins may be unrelated, but given Poncho Man's behavior, I have a sneaking suspicion that they are linked. Thankfully, we haven't heard or seen anything about Poncho Man in the last few months. We got a new doorbell with a camera, and the cops left the area where they were stinging us. I hope this whole thing is over and I never have to meet Poncho Man again. Don't go just yet. The next story awaits, and it's even more horrifying than the last. Can you handle it? This occurred two years ago, before my mother and I relocated. I was in college, staying at home to save money while attending classes and working a part-time job. And because my mother had recently divorced, she appreciated having me around. We had four cats, but I joked that if she lived on her own, she'd turn into crazy cat lady. This happened right after she ended her turbulent relationship with my father. My father has nothing to do with this story, and I adore him, but he and my mother were simply not compatible. They did an odd positive note, and they are better friends now than they were when they were married. However, the events leading up to their breakup were not ideal. Okay, I'll leave it at that. We lived in a nice neighborhood in my city's residential area. My street was one of the few that provided off-street parking for each individual home as city life required everyone to park on the street or wherever they could. It used to be a nicer neighborhood, but everything else eventually built up around it. This day, after my classes, which I was taking via Zoom due to the pandemic craziness, I would frequently go down to a two block away supermarket to shop for dinner, which I always made for my mother. She busted her ass at work, and I always liked to make something relaxing for both of us to end the day on. I also enjoy cooking. That's exactly what I was doing when it all started. I went to the store to get what I needed that night, just a couple of things I'd forgotten on my usual weekly shopping trip. I noticed a man in his late thirties staring at me as I walked through the aisles. I couldn't tell at first because, really, how can you tell in situations like that, that someone is looking at you and not something else in the store? But I was looking at some produce when he came over and said, excuse me, I don't want you to think I'm weird, but I wanted to tell you that you have really great legs. Have we met before? Okay. That's not awkward. I know I'm in really good shape and take care of my body, and that wouldn't be strange if the situation hadn't been with a total stranger, but I just gave a meek thank you and moved away. I only saw him one or two more times as I walked around the rest of the store, and I just chalked it up to a guy who didn't know how to talk to women and was giving it his best shot. I checked out all of my items and took the short walk home, laughing about things and thinking about what I was going to tell my mom when I saw her. When I got home, I put everything away and cracked out some of my assignments before starting dinner. I went to get the mail, and as I walked out my front door, I noticed what appeared to be the same man I had seen in the grocery store, now standing on the sidewalk about two houses down from mine. It was only a quick glance, but I noticed the red ball cap he had been wearing and realized it was the same guy. I didn't try to be paranoid. I just went back inside and tried not to think about it. Who knows? It could have been a neighbor I'd never seen before or someone visiting someone in my neighborhood. We're a very close knit community and everyone knows each other by first name. But to be honest, I couldn't say I knew everyone who lived there, so I went back inside and began preparing dinner. It was now around 4.30 p.m., about 45 minutes before my mother arrived home from work. When the front doorbell rang, I went to answer it and, of course, just looked outside to see who it was. Before opening the door, there was no one there, so I immediately thought, 
UPS, FedEx. I opened the door to see if a package had been left, and when I noticed there was no package on our front porch, I glanced up the street once more. What I did see was a figure running away wearing a red ball cap, which raised a new set of questions in my mind. Was it the same guy? Was it a neighborhood kid who resembled him who was just playing a prank on me? I mean, who hasn't done the whole ding dong ditch thing in their life? I shut the door, returned to dinner, and waited for my mom to arrive, at which point I gave her a few minutes to relax before dinner and told her about what had happened that afternoon. When I told her there were so many coincidences, she kind of shrugged. How could we conclude that it's the same guy you saw in the store doing those things and saying those things? We got on with our evening and I had more reading to do for school. So, after feeding the cats and playing with a few of them before bed, I should mention that two of them are extremely lovable. One is 50-50 and the other is the complete epitome of a nasty house. The cat loves you when he wants to make sure you know you are serving him and is significantly less affectionate than the other cats. But for some reason, Tom was hanging out near me and after a few seconds of trying to pet him, Tom jumped away and went up into the bay window, looking out over our front porch. He is certainly a protector as well as a jerk, and I heard his low growl as he looked out the window. I was switching off the lights in our living room, and when the room was dark, I walked over to where Tom was sitting. He has a growl that sounds like he's purring, but there's a menacing aspect to it, and you can tell he's mad. I asked him what he was looking at, and he kind of looked over his shoulder at me before returning to looking out the front window, so I crouched next to him and pulled the curtain over to the side to see what he was looking at. And knowing Tom, it was probably just someone taking their dog for a walk or something similar. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, and the street light right next to my yard and my neighbor's yard was shining brightly, and there was nothing else going on. But it was at the edge of the light that I thought I saw someone standing looking at our house and my heart sank when I realized it was the same person with the red ball cap. So I went up to my room, which also had a view of the street through the trees. There were no leaves on the trees because it was winter. And when I arrived, I looked over to the street light where we had just been looking. And sure enough, across the street, just in the shadows, was someone wearing a red ball cap. I called my mom and said, hey, I think that guy is outside again. He just stood there for a few minutes before turning and walking across the street directly under the light and that's when I knew it was the same guy. And she walked into my room just as the figure was walking back up the street out of sight. Mom said to just make sure all the doors were locked, asked what my plans were for the next day and said she would also make sure to take better stock of the surroundings because things were getting strange at this point. Nothing unusual happened that night after 2.30. Cat freakout is something that every cat owner goes through. I mean, we love them, but they drive us insane, right? The next morning, I got up at my usual time to go to the gym and as I was backing down our driveway from our garage, I was looking on both sides in the dark, trying not to be paranoid to see if anyone was standing outside our house. I kept expecting to see someone, but I didn't. So I just finished my workout and was on my way home. Knowing that I needed to shower quickly to get to my first class and that my mom would be gone by then, I got cleaned up, ate something, and then logged on for my Zoom meeting. The terror has just begun. Keep watching, but be warned. The darkness grows stronger with each passing moment. Two up to make some tea after a rather dull lecture. When I looked out my kitchen window into our small backyard and realized I hadn't closed the garage door, that's when I noticed him. I recognized the man with long hair, a green military style jacket, and a red ball cap. 
he had his gaze fixed on our garage. I immediately reached for the extra garage remote control that we keep in our kitchen. I pressed the button and went to the back door. Hey, who are you? I yelled as I opened it. What are you doing in our backyard? The guy never even looked at me and bolted down our driveway to the street, which is why I called my mother to tell her what had happened and she told me to call the police. I dialed the non-emergency number and informed them that there was a strange person in our neighborhood whom I had never seen before, but I thought I had seen him at the store before and that he had talked to me. Keep an eye out for him and call us back if you see him again, okay? Sure, I said, knowing that the only way anyone would come out was if something serious happened. Nothing happened the rest of the day or the next evening, but things were about to get worse. The next day, I went to the gym, which is about two miles from my house, and I was talking to a friend as we walked back to our cars, as it was just starting to get light. When I came to a halt, I noticed the same guy standing at the edge of the gym's parking lot. I told my friend that someone was following me, and we both went back inside right away. I told some of the guys at the gym, and I also called the police from there. I told them that someone I thought had been hanging around my house was now hanging around the gym where I was, and they told me to stay put this time. They did send someone out, and the officer asked me for a detailed description of the person and what he'd been doing, and then asked me to repeat what I told the police the day before. He asked if he could follow me home, and I said yes, that would be great. He gave me his card and told me to call him if anything else happened, and he said he was going to make a full report and see if a patrol car could go up and down our neighborhood a couple of times during the day to see if anyone was hanging out or maybe even scare off someone who may have been hiding out. I was worried about going home and being alone, so I decided to go to the public library instead of going home, and I emailed my professors to let them know I would be working on assignments but wouldn't be in class that day. I'm not sure why I thought that would be a good idea, but being around other people made me feel better. I stayed at the library for most of the day, except for going to get something to eat around one, and then I went home. My phone rang, and it was my mother, who was already home for some reason, yelling into the phone that she had seen the guy standing on our porch when she pulled in, same jacket, same hair, same ball cap. I told her to call the cops right away and that I was on my way home. She initially told me to stay away, but I wasn't about to leave my mother home alone with some weirdo stalking around our house. When I got home, an officer and another car pulled up in front of our house and we told them what had happened again and they said they were going to put a full description out on their radios for anyone matching the description we gave them. I asked them about driving around our neighborhood because the first officer I spoke with said that's what they do and the officer confirmed that they had, but they hadn't seen anything or anyone out of the ordinary. My mom and I, we're both scared at this point because this was someone who wasn't going away, and even though I joked about it, I was kind of freaked out because whoever this guy was didn't seem to change his clothes. When I pointed this out to the officer, the other officer said he might be a homeless person who was just confused, which made me laugh out loud because it was definitely the same person I saw in the store. And if he was a homeless person who was confused, he sure had a funny way of expressing it. After our conversation and his strange compliment, the police left and I made something to eat for dinner, but thankfully, my mom and I were both on edge. It was Friday and my boyfriend was coming over to visit. He lived about an hour away and was planning on staying for the weekend. We all just decided to have a few drinks and relax and we were planning on going out to meet some of my friends, but I suddenly didn't feel like that and just wanted to be with Chris at home. We're now engaged to be married, by the way, and he tried to keep the evening light for us, 
knowing we were a little shaken up. And as the evening progressed, we had a couple of bottles of wine and my mother decided to retire for the evening. We were just kind of doing our thing, making out in the living room and talking about everything that was in our future. Around 12.30, Chris looked up and said, someone's outside, to which I replied, what do you mean? He also mentioned hearing someone on the porch but wasn't sure if they were still there. He walked over to the bay window while the lights were turned off in the living room. He ripped the curtains open and there he was, staring into the windows from the other side. This was the first time we both saw him and he didn't look like he did in the store. He appears creepy to me. His eyes seemed to pop out of his head. Chris jumped back and then ran to the front door with me telling him not to open it. He wasn't paying attention to me as he dashed out from under the front porch and tackled the man. I mean, he really threw him down. They both jumped over the porch railing into the bushes and onto the ice. They were rolling around everywhere. My mother came down because I was screaming. The cats were going crazy inside. Chris let out a very loud yell at this point. As he clutched onto this guy, I was standing on the porch, yelling to see if he was okay. Fortunately, my mother had called 911. Chris was yelling obscenities at him and I could see darkness on the snow around our bushes. But I kept screaming, not realizing it was blood at the time. Now that the lights were turning on in our neighbor's houses, my next door neighbor came out with a flashlight and rushed over to Chris and the guy. It seemed like an eternity. But when the cops arrived, they grabbed both Chris and the guy and separated them. I was trying to keep it together but kept yelling for Chris and my neighbor was doing his best to keep the other guy from helping the cop. Stay with us as the horror unfolds. The story continues and the nightmares are only getting worse. Can you face the fear? When another police car arrived, things calmed down a little but the man was screaming about someone named Scarlet and how he needed to see her. Chris finally spoke up, saying, I've been stabbed. And the cops responded quickly. Even with the street light, it was difficult to see things in the dark. Chris had actually been stabbed twice. Once in each of his thighs and once in each of his arms. Another cop car arrived and everyone in the neighborhood surrounded our yard and an ambulance was called for Chris. My mother was in tears on the porch and I was crying my eyes out, hoping Chris would be okay. He kept saying he'd be fine, but the cops said, you need to get to the hospital right now. They loaded the man in the red ball cap into a car and attempted to calm down the neighborhood. Another car arrived and there were many questions for me, my mother, and, of course, Chris. One of the police officers discovered the knife with which the man had stabbed Chris, and it was a large survival knife. I was asked to accompany Chris to the hospital, and another officer would be following us there. When we arrived, Chris needed stitches in his arm for a really big gash, but the stab wound in his right thigh required staples. The knife was so sharp that it split his leg open like a ripe melon. Chris was in stable condition but had lost a lot of blood in our front yard as well as on the way to the hospital, so I breathed a sigh of relief. The officer who stayed with us asked us a lot more questions and informed us that the man was indeed homeless and mentally ill. He was convinced I was his ex-wife, and when he saw me at the store, he told the cops that he needed to talk to me about his divorce. He wasn't high on drugs, he just wasn't in his head anymore. I later found out more about him, and it's a very sad story, 
His wife had cheated on him with his business partner and the two of them had stolen all the money from the business and fled together. They had taken this guy for everything he had in his life and he had gone insane and then gone into the streets about eight years before all of this happened to me. We had to press charges and he was placed in a criminal facility in a hospital. For all I know, he's still there, but he pleaded guilty to all of the charges because someone convinced him that it was the best thing for him to do, and I'd like to think that somewhere in his sane mind, he realized who he really was, where he was, and what he'd been up to. Chris recovered well. My mother decided to relocate to Florida and sell the house. I got my own place as soon as I finished school, and Chris and I plan to relocate as soon as I finish my degree. So that's my story of being stalked by a guy who mistook me for someone else. It's too bad he couldn't talk to me, or maybe I could have talked to him to let him know I wasn't who he mistook me for. Perhaps all of this could have been avoided. I'm grateful to the police officers who responded and took what I was saying seriously after the first call, even though I didn't think they cared at all, and I'm much more cautious about being with people when I go out now, even though I know I'm safe. Every now and then, I'll notice someone staring at me in a store, a bar, or a restaurant, and I'll think to myself, oh, boy, is this going to be round two? It's difficult to break out of that mindset, Please share my story if you do. And all I can say to everyone is to be aware of their surroundings and not dismiss anything if you have a gut feeling that something is wrong. I have no ill will toward the guy who did this and I just hope that he gets the help he needs and can get back into life. I'm not sure if that's possible, but there's always the possibility. The nightmare is an over. Stay with us and uncover the terrifying truth in the next story. But remember, no one is safe. The event took place on Saturday. I am a female who is 29 years old, and I now live in a neighborhood that is regarded as being relatively secure. Certainly not the best, but also not one that is often thought of as being particularly perilous. Even though it was not even that late, about 9.30 in the evening, because it was summer in my nation, it had been dark for little more than an hour or two at the absolute most. Despite the fact that it was not even that late, the sun was still up. Because my friend needed to get back to her house in a hurry, I had to bid her farewell before she boarded the mode of transportation that would take her there. There was something I needed to say to her, but I was scared that I would forget it once I got back to my place. But a few months ago, someone snatched my phone right out of my hands, so ever since then, I've avoided taking it out of my pocket until I was in a safe place to do so. After rounding a corner, I saw that there is only one block between here and my house, and this street is rather narrow. I had just about convinced myself that there was no immediate threat to my safety when, all of a sudden, someone spoke to me. It was difficult for me to understand what he was attempting to convey to me because of the slurring in his voice. And the place was completely dark, but after some time I was able to figure it out. He was demanding that I hand over anything to him, whether it was my phone, my wallet, or something else. He was insisting that I give him whatever it was. I focused my attention on him, and despite the darkness, I was able to make out the shape of what appeared to be a rifle in the hand that he appeared to be holding. I stared at him. I have a strong suspicion that it was all an elaborate fake, yet it still gave me the creeps. When I turned around for whatever reason, I saw that another woman was coming up behind me, from a rather close distance. I was surprised to see her. I screamed for help and quickly ran away from the man, all the while bracing myself for the agony that I may feel in the event that the gun wasn't a hoax. After the woman yelled at me to stop running 
and to go get inside one of the buildings that was closest to us. Both of us afterwards suffered an anxiety attack as a result of what had just transpired. Because I was so focused on the prospect of a gun, the woman told me that the man had been standing next to a car, but I had not noticed him there. She explained that this was because I was so preoccupied with the chance of a gun. I have a strong suspicion that the man's only interest was in my phone and nothing else. Nevertheless, the fact that he was able to flee so easily and so fast, as well as the concept T that there was a possibility that I might have lost more than just my mobile phone, were both things that gave me cause for concern and made this situation feel pretty uneasy. Having said that, to the guy in question, I really do wish that we would never run into each other again. In addition, I want to thank the woman who helped me while I was stressed out by opening the door for me and giving me a drink of water, as well as the lady who helped me walk the final block to my house with a friend of hers. You are all my heroes, and I'm sorry that I didn't get your names or properly thank you for everything you've done. I really appreciate everything you've done. Congratulations, you've survived for now. But remember, the darkness is always lurking. Subscribe to Terrifying Tales TV and join us again for another bone-chilling episode. Sleep well if you dare.